And joining us now for some analysis, David Ignatius of the Washington Post and Michael Crowley, who wrote the cover story for this week's Time magazine on Vladimir Putin and our own State Department correspondent, Margaret Brennan. Uh, David, let me just start with you. Uh, it was very interesting to hear Secretary Gates. It's always interesting to hear these officials after they've been there and they can step back a little time has passed. He, uh, you know, he he gave, I think his book was a fairly balanced account, as he argued in this interview, but uh, he wasn't afraid to uh, say they, they've made some real mistakes. You know, the, the reason that Secretary Gates was so effective, and you saw this, I thought, throughout your interesting interview with him, is that he's smart, he's bipartisan, he served presidents from both parties, and he's tough. He kept saying about Shinseki at the VA, Shinseki needs to, to impose accountability. He needs to go in there and dig. And I watched Secretary Gates covering the Pentagon um, fire people. I mean, if, if you did the wrong thing in Bob Gates' eyes, you were out. Mm -hmm. And uh, he imposed a degree of accountability on that big, impossible to manage place that it's rarely seen. And, and I think that's really the message I'd take away from that interview if you're looking at. So we talked about the Secret Service problems. They need accountability. They need somebody to just go in and look at what happened and fire the people who did things wrong. Same thing with VA. Uh, same thing with the kind of policies in our financial sector that Elizabeth Warren talked about. That seems like the missing thing right now in our public life is holding people accountable, not in a partisan, nasty way, but in the sense of good public management. Well, you know, I mean, uh, to, to your point, uh, I remember very well when the Air Force uh, when it turned up they were being kind of careless with handling nuclear weapons. He fired not only the Air Force chief, the chief of staff, and the secretary. He also fired the secretary of I the Air Force. I remember being around the building right after that, and I'll tell you, Bob, people were scared of being seen to be making mistakes in the eyes of Secretary Bob Gates. The whole place tightened down, and everybody said, "Well, oh, I better get this right," which is the kind of management culture this town needs so badly. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Syria and what's going on there. He, he obviously said we should have done some things in the beginning, Margaret, and, and also Michael, uh, that we didn't do, and now we have what we have. Where do you see this thing coming out? Well, it looks like Assad uh, has the upper hand now. Um, they're, the rebels have essentially given up the, and they were dug into a hole in homes, which was the birthplace of the revolution, and have uh, agreed to a deal with the government um, there was a time when there was no talk of doing any kind of a, a deal with the government. It would be unthinkable. Uh, the Obama administration, I think, might dispute that there was a time when you could really turn the course of this thing, that there was ever a way that we could manage that chaos to an outcome we want. And by the way, Bob, you know, I think there's some ambivalence about what outcome we do want. Um, there are people in this administration who think that what would follow Assad might very well be worse, that you could have radical Islamist al-Qaeda affiliated elements uh, running at least large portions of the country and that that would be very bad and it, the, Assad might be the least of the evils here. The last thing I'll say, something worth watching very closely, is the debate underway now about whether to provide more sophisticated weaponry to the rebels, in particular surface-to-air missiles that the rebels are pleading for and the Saudis are pressuring the Obama administration to provide. There's this fascinating conversation happening right now. Can you outfit these surface-to-air missiles with biometric locks and GPS uh, devices that would prevent them from be ta being taken to other areas or given to other people and potentially to shoot down civilian airliners, which could freeze up the global air traffic system and cause an economic catastrophe? It's a really hard call, but there's a lot of pressure on the administration right now to move forward with that. You know, I think that is an excellent point. Uh, well, Margaret, you're at the State Department every day. Uh, what do you think is going to happen here? Are we going to give uh, more aid? Uh, is there very much we can do right now? Well, I, I tell you, no one at the State Department would say on the record what Secretary Gates did, which was there's no diplomatic solution, because officially that's the U.S. position. We can negotiate with someone, Bashar al-Assad, who has no interest whatsoever in negotiating himself out of power. What we are seeing quietly and what's not talked about is some of the increased support with getting the Gulf countries slowly on the same page in terms of who they're funneling money and weapons to. You've heard some progress on that front and an awareness that the people who end up running the country are not the ones necessarily who will be at the White House or here in Washington this week. You do have the leader of the main Syrian opposition going to the White House later this week. Um, and that's supposed to be a sign 
back home in Syria that the U.S. is standing by you. We are increasing non-lethal support officially. There's more that's sort of creeping in terms of support, but the administration has been incredibly reluctant to really get full-on engaged in a conflict. Will the president see this, this leader, this rebel leader who's coming? Unclear, and uh, officials are very noncommittal about that. Uh, Ahmed al-Jarba, who is now the head of the political opposition, is supposed to meet with uh, uh, Susan Rice. Perhaps the president could drop by, but there's no official statement of any of that. He did meet with Secretary Kerry this week. Uh, Michael, you uh, did the cover story on Putin. Uh, let me just ask you what I asked uh, Secretary Gates. So what's, what's this about <laughs> from Putin's point of view? I think it's about a couple of things, Bob. The one thing that people will have heard a lot of discussion about is restoring Russia to its lost greatness. Uh, Putin very strongly felt a kind of humiliation over the collapse of the Soviet Union and a feeling that the West kind of danced on the Soviet Union's grave, expanded NATO, according to Putin, violating explicit promises not to do so, right up to Russia's doorstep. Uh, and a feeling that Ukraine was never really a, a real country, should never have been an independent country. And he has accomplished a lot of that now. I'm not sure he will actually occupy or invade Ukraine, but he's fully destabilized it. It's going to force decentralization by the government in Kiev after these next elections, prevent any short-term uh, NATO or EU membership. The other point that has not gotten as much as much attention is what's going on at home. Putin is over 80% in his approval ratings. That is a four-year high. He is clamping down on opposition, forcing bloggers to register, knocking some bloggers offline entirely, shutting down TV stations, any, any, what little independent critical voices, what few independent critical voices there were are now being silenced. And this guy is consolidating his power. Remember, after a time, it has not been a totally smooth ride for him. He did face some substantial protests in Moscow and other parts of the country after he returned to the presidency. So in some ways, that may be the most important, important part of this game for him, and I think he's winning it. I think Mike Rogers made an interesting point talking about this. We keep hearing about movement of those troops along the border. He says they're just replacing uh, troops, that this is a rotation that's going he, on. Putin clearly wants to keep that pressure on, I'm, I'm sure, through the Ukrainian uh, elections on May 25, probably long after. Um, we've learned a lot about Vladimir Putin watching him in this, in this crisis. And uh, the only disagreement I have with Michael is, I think Putin is running a country that's much weaker economically and politically than we sometimes realize. That Russian financial markets have fallen on the order of 15 percent, and that was from a fairly weak base to start off with. It's basically a one commodity economy, uh, export of energy. Uh, it isn't modernizing in the way that its Western European neighbors are. Um, Putin is going to have trouble keeping as, as many troops in the field for as long as he seems uh, to want to. And I've, I've finally been struck by the way in which he's kind of winging it. You know, he, he, he massed those troops, appeared ready to invade Ukraine. Then I think as he saw that the U.S. and Germany were standing together, I thought that was not such a good idea and has been pulling back and made a statement last week that he thought the election should go forward. So we, sh we shouldn't think that this is a master player who's thought every move through to the end of the chess game. He's a, a very aggressive, kind of bumptious leader who's trying to put his country back uh, in the game, but I don't think he's thought it through all the way. Are, are there more sanctions coming? From the EU, um, you hear from European officials, you could see some as soon as Monday, certainly later in the week, but the U.S. seems to be moving much more slowly on this. I mean, you did see some tightening. It was very interesting that the U.S. sanctioned Russia for the first time for its support of Syria. Remember, they're also backing the Assad regime on a few fronts. Ukraine and others, they're not doing what we would like. But it's really this May 25th election that the U.S. and Europe are very focused on and making sure they're going to flood the country with election monitors. Um, a tenth of that delegation is going to be Americans to try to see that this election actually becomes legitimate. Um, and that'll help put in place a new government in Ukraine. But Putin maybe didn't even need to invade because he certainly destabilized and achieved that aim. Let me ask you all about this uh, awful thing that's happening in Nigeria. Uh, you heard Secretary Gates say there really is not a lot we can do besides providing some intelligence uh, help, drones, things of that nature. Uh, but you also heard Mike Rogers say we should have gotten more involved in, in that whole situation a long time ago. Michael? Well, uh, there has been a robust debate about that, and uh, Hillary Clinton and her camp are on the defensive right now because it has been reported that she uh, 
chose not to put Boko Haram on the uh, terrorist designation list a couple years ago. I think there, I think it's a reasonable argument. There were a lot of smart people who said there were reasons not to do this. The top State Department official who works on Africa uh, advised against it. Um, and it's not entirely clear to me that it's not clear at all to me that that would have made a decisive difference in what's happening now. One big problem we have had, I actually was at um, remarks the president made before meeting with the president of Nigeria when he was up for the UN in 2013, is human rights abuses by the Nigerian military, which I think have frozen our cooperation with them to fight Boko Haram because that military has been guilty of allegedly some serious human rights abuses. So it's really hard to find the neat solution on this. The, the last thing I'll say, though, is I think Mike Rogers made the right point, which is that there is a lot of Islamic radicalism in northern Africa right now. You remember the terrible attack on the mall in Kenya. You remember when Mali was sort of the big foreign crisis of the day. And this is a new iteration of al-Qaeda that I think the government is still getting its arms around. How do we deal with it? It's very different from the core al-Qaeda in Pakistan we're used to dealing with. A lot of these guys are not actually al-Qaeda, but they are affiliated with them, inspired by them. How do you fight that? Well, I, uh, although we all hope that somehow or another those children are still alive, nearly 300 of them, uh, at this point there is no indication uh, that they are. We really still don't know anything about that situation. Well, thank you all, and we'll be right back.